Hello folks and welcome or welcome back to the channel. And in this video we're going to look at something completely different. And I guess you're wondering what this car is going to be. It isn't an old timer, it is what I would call a young timer. And yes, it's the BMW Z3. And it's not just a Z, it is actually the coupe version. Most likely the ugliest car that BMW ever built. But it's so ugly that most people love it. And in this video I'm going to try to take you through the critical points to look for once you decided to buy a BMW Z3. And more specifically the coupe. Now this one is not the M version. I would have loved the M version but I couldn't get my hands on them. They are very rare and very expensive. The coupe like this one, well, there were only about 7,674 built, and that is not a lot. And that's why they are picking up value very quickly. So now it's the time to buy one. So let me tell you what I check for when I'm buying a Z3, or any other car for that matter. So once you made up your mind to buy a Z3, Roadster or Coupe, the first thing that comes to our mind is the price. So how much should you pay for a Z3? Well, that depends on four factors. The first factor is how rare is the car? The lower the production numbers, the more people want to have this car because it's far more rare. For instance, the Z3 Coupe as the one we have right here, the 2.8 liter. Well, there were about 7,671 built. So that's not a lot compared to the Roadster of which they built about 50,000 of them. So that's a big difference. So that's why the Roadster is less popular with car fanatics than actually the Coupe, just because of the sheer amount of numbers of cars that were built. If you're looking at the Z3M, then it's another ball game altogether because there were far less numbers produced of the M version around. I think it's around 6,000 in total of the Coupe and about another 7,000, I believe, or 15,000, I should say, of the Roadster, of the M version. So those are very much wanted, the M version, and you will pay an arm and a leg for those uh, to get them. The four cylinders, well, they go for very cheap prices, and the Roadster is very cheap, and that's just because there are so many of them. So now what about the real price? Well, I can't give you a price right away, because we still need to look at the mileage. The car has to have a reasonable mileage, an acceptable, realistic mileage. Uh, extremely low and extremely high is no good. It should be somewhere in the middle. Now the mileage you're typically going to check on the dashboard and on this car we're having 119,000 kilometers, so which is about 75,000 miles, which I think it's a fair mileage. But it's important that you have a track record of the mileage. Where I live, the cars have to go to a technical inspection every year. And when the car is sold, um, you can get a car pass. And this is a car pass which is listing actually the history of the mileage of the car since the moment it was brought into traffic. It came actually into traffic in 2000, although it's in 1999, um, with about 8,000 kilometers. Now the first year it picked up a lot of mileage, but then you can see it just slowly increments. There are no abnormal gaps in between these different years. And the last mileage that was recorded at the technical inspection station was about 190,000 kilometers at the 7th of June 2021. So I know for sure that this car has gone through a proper mileage recording that there was no messing around with the uh, mileage counter in the car because that happens sometimes. So always try to get this kind of a record. But cars with about 75,000 miles are a pretty good choice or 120,000 clicks or 100,000 clicks, kilometers that is. Uh, it's pretty good. Um, on the other hand, um, mileage doesn't say everything. Mileage is uh, it's often misleading. You can have a car with a lot of miles, but they are highway miles, and then you have other cars that have lower mileage, but then it's city mileage. So if it was used as a daily commuter in the city, it's going to have far more wear and tear than the car that was used at the weekend only for longer trips, but it may have more mileage. So look that up where the guy is living. Have a look um, what he used the car for. That's important. So the lower the mileage in general, 
the higher the prices will be. So normally the car should come with a maintenance book that logs all the actions that were done on the car. It should have the chassis number on it. And then you should have all the subsequent stamps for the inspections, inspection one, inspection two, and so on. When the brake fluid was changed, all these things. And you should have a mileage on it. You get an official stamp on it where it was done and the date. And you can see that that happened pretty well. So you can follow as well then the mileage that the car had based on its uh, record of maintenance. Now, if it doesn't have a maintenance record, then I would get a little bit worried uh, because then most likely the car was not maintained at the BMW dealership, which doesn't mean it was badly maintained, but it would be something really to think about. But be aware of funny things in the maintenance book. Uh, look on this one here. You can see it's been done a couple of times. But then it looks like it was almost written with the same pen. I would almost say it was done almost on the same date, if I'm not mistaken. But then again, you don't know. I mean, the date is like two years different, but the pen looks exactly the same. So, and there's no stamp on it. So this could be true or this could not be true. I did check with the owner of the car and he referred me to a small shop where this was done. And I did check it with the shop and it turned out to be valid. But be aware because people use fraud on those maintenance books as well and it would not be uncommon. And then of course you have the overall state of the car, the overall condition. Is it original? Has it been resprayed? You know, has it been maintained very well? All these things you need to look at. Now based on all that, I'm going to give you a few figures. Um, a Z3 Coupe, like the one I have here from 1999, in a fairly good condition with a normal amount of mileage on it, let's say around 120,000 miles, it's going to cost you around between 15,000 to 19,000 euros. That's where I live, of course. It might be different where you live, but that's kind of the range. If you're going to buy a 2.8 liter Roadster, well, that's probably going to run you around 8 to 10,000 euros. You can see already the difference. If you go for a four cylinder Roadster, you can't get a four cylinder coupe that doesn't exist. But if you go for a four cylinder Roadster, you get them for between 3,000 to about seven, 8,000 euros in, in a very good condition and the 8,000 version. So you see prices really change a lot. If you go for the M version, then you're going to end up with a very high price tag. It's about 35,000 euros uh, to begin with and up to 45 and even above that. Uh, and that is very expensive. Uh, so, but if you can get your hands on one, it's certainly while doing it because these cars are becoming very rare. So that's why I always recommend go for a rare car. And I think the Z3 Coupe is one of those. Always check the paperwork first. Make sure that you have a certificate of conformity with the car, which is listing all the details and options on the car. It's also listing the chassis number. And that's the next thing we're going to check. Make sure that you have the maintenance uh, manual or the maintenance record with it. And then make sure that you have your MOT document. Now, mine is a Belgian one that's slightly different. But if you have to get uh, MOT, make sure you, the paper comes with it and that's valid on the recent date and that it is not red. So in other words, it, was, it did not fail on anything. Uh, this car has a couple of remarks. I know this and I'll talk to you about these remarks because that's a common problem with the Z3s. But don't worry, that's coming. These are one of the points you want to check. So now let us first check uh, the chassis number because that should be the first thing you do after you've done all the rest of the paperwork. To check the chassis number, you will have to pop the hood and you can find the chassis number in two places. The first place where you can find it and that's normally just a sticker. It's on the right hand side and the stamp chassis number is on the frame right here. And it's a bit hard to see, but let me give you a little bit of a close up. And that's the sticker on the right side wing. And you can actually see the chassis number right there. And that should match up the chassis number that you actually have on your certificate of conformity or your title. And the stamp chassis number is right here on the metal part behind this plastic bar. It's a bit hard to see, but if you have a light, you can actually shine, shine through and see the number in there. I don't think you will see it on the camera, but check it out. That's where it is at the end of the engine block. And that should match up with the sticker and your paperwork. And if all the paperwork is fine and the chassis is fine, go around the car and look around all the rubbers, 
look it over overall and, and look for any new parts that you might see or really worn out parts and take your time because I know if you're looking at a new car that you want to get people tend to go blind a bit sometimes and you, you don't see all the issues you just overlook them that happens to me as well believe me if you're so desperate in trying to get something you only see the pretty things but look around, look for dents, look for serious scratches, look for deformation on the car and check it out and take your time um, because it's important also check it out on the inside if the seats are fine, if the dashboard is not cracked you know, it, what are the control levers, uh, are they not worn out you know, all that kind of stuff, is the lining good, is there no humidity inside What's the state of the carpets? Check the pedals, so the wear and tear on the pedals, because sometimes the pedals uh, on the throttle and the clutch and the brake, they may actually be worn out and you might show a low mileage on the car, that something is not right on that car. So check it all out, um, in the front and in the back, making sure everything is as it's supposed to be and complete. Open and close the doors, check out that there's not too much play. Now pay attention to these windows because they are kind of unlocking a little bit when you open up the door and when you close the door they go up again. You might have seen there's no frame on the top of the windows so um, that's important because they can go wrong sometimes a bit. Check the windscreen for scratches if there are any scratches on it. Um, you know all these kind of various checks on the surface, not that it's critical if you have a scratch on your windscreen but it's something to negotiate on the price. So you looked around the car overall and it seems to be okay, there was nothing abnormal, nothing was missing on the car. Of course we haven't checked the wheels, we haven't checked the suspension, we haven't checked the engine, we haven't checked many things yet and we're going to do this. But while you were looking over the car, you might have liked the color of the car or maybe you disliked the color, but I assume you would have liked the color of the car and we all like a glossy, shiny car. Now let's face it, these cars are 20 years old or more. The paint will be scratched. There is no doubt about it. There's no way that the paint cannot be scratched. You will have chip marks on the bonnet, for sure. If you find a car that has no chip marks and no scratches, at all, then you can rest assured that this car has been totally resprayed or partially resprayed. If it's been partially resprayed, it might have been a problem from an accident. Now, if it's been repaired properly, it's not an issue. But sometimes they are not repaired properly. So watch out for that and ask the owner why this part was repainted. And it's an easy to check to do. Let me show you on how I'm checking for scratches and little things. Unless you have, of course, a paint density meter, which I don't have, that is very handy. You just put it on there and it will tell you the thickness of the paint and then you can see where work has been done. And the front of this bonnet has no chip marks, which is kind of awkward because I would expect some. And then I spotted this little old chip mark right there, which is now filled up with paint. And what I can tell is that this bonnet has been repainted. You can actually see it um, overall and in some areas you even see some sanding marks. And if you look closely you can see the sanding marks in this area. Another good area to look for scratches on the paint is underneath the handles. And of course you can actually see the emblems as well if they have damage on them or not. And this looks like a normal wear and tear of a 20 year old car. So I know in the back nothing has happened. So after you inspected the paint and you noticed that the car was completely being repainted, then that should raise a question and ask the owner or whoever is selling it why this was repainted because that's not normal. Unless it had a very se severe accident or the paint was really awful and something had happened with it. But ask for an explanation. But it's something to be aware of and to stay clear of. It doesn't necessarily mean it's bad, but I, I would be very careful. The other thing is if you have partial repainted panels, like in this case the bonnet, uh, then you should ask also the question because that could be the result of an accident. And in my case, um, this was the result of an accident. Uh, it had a small accident on the front wheel and the bonnet here and that's why the bonnet was repainted and you'll see it when we lift up the car. But it's been repaired very well and I've seen the bills and it was done at a BMW repair facility.
So it's not always bad news. I did pop the bonnet and this is the right hand side and you can see on these bolts here that this has been removed because there's no paint there. See that? So this is the original paint but because this has been removed once the washer didn't go back in the exact same place. So I checked this one, checked that one and I also checked the other side of the car and it was the same. So this front part has been removed at some moment in time. And by just looking on the car, I can tell that this light here has been replaced once. Uh, this looks like brand new and there's no scratches on the plastic or very few compared to the other side. And that also confirms that this car had had an accident. That's the one on the right, on the left hand side and you can see the plastic is far more deteriorated than the other one because it is actually older. But the good thing about it is that the repair was done at a BMW shop with original parts and you can see that on the stickers and that was also confirmed by the bills uh, by the owner. And while you walk around the car, check for equal spacing of all the panels, the doors, the bonnets, because you should have no pinching areas and they should be all more or less the same. And the Z3 series is built on the E36 platform. So a lot of parts are coming from the E36 and the body itself is not known to have any serious rust problems unless it was badly repaired. Now rust is typically not a problem on these cars, but I have a bit of surface rust right here. This is where the fender sits and probably it's because it's been collecting dirt, you see? That dirt and the dirt stays wet and then of course things will rust. Uh, but it's still pretty solid so this is just surface rust so we'll clean that up and get that sorted out and in fact most of it might actually be caused by stones being thrown onto the chassis from the wheel while you were driving it so um, we'll probably put a stone guard up but also check the rim underneath the doors there should be no rust whatsoever in this area and sometimes you see that but not always it depends a bit on how good the seals on the windows are if the seals are intact and you will never see a problem in this area. That's about the only area that I've seen on these C3s where they tend to rust a bit unless they've been badly repaired. Except at the rear where the rear differential is and we'll have a closer look once we start talking about the differential and the rear axle and the suspension. But that's about the only area where you really should be worried about uh, rust because overall these are very good uh, against rust. The Z3 Coupe comes with two types of engines, the 2.8 liter and the 3 liter. In fact, there's even a third one, but very uncommon where I live. Uh, it's always a six cylinder. They don't have anything else than six cylinders in the Z3s. It's a very solid and reliable engine, and it develops about 190 horsepower uh, for the 2.8 liter. If you go in for the M series, then the block is what we call the M54 block. Uh, this is the M52 block. It's a great block, very reliable, but it has a couple of weak spots like anything else for that matter. But if you're going to look at the engine itself, then you should scan around on the engine and see how clean that is. If it's extremely clean, or you can notice that it's been steam cleaned very recently, then that's not a good sign either. It means the car hasn't been maintained very well, and they just did it uh, to sell it. Um, this engine bay is exactly how I found it and yet it has some dirt here and there but it looks like it's not been messed around with and it's been kept pretty clean. I have to admit I took some dust off the valve covers here. Um, so the first thing you need to do is to do a couple of checks. Checks, Check the liquids, uh, the engine oil, uh, the brake oil, uh, the cooling liquid and, and these different things and, and then we're going to start talking about the weak spots of this engine the things you should check because they go bad on these areas so let's check the oil in this car and see how it looks like and there's no foam on it and that's important to see that you have no foam on it the oil still looks very clean although the last change was about a year ago but there was not a lot of mileage done with it but that looks good. If you see any foam or anything like that, then stay clear of that because that would be a bad sign. And you also might want to check the filler cap and see if you have no white deposits and that looks very clean indeed. So not an issue at all with the oil at least. 
doesn't tell me anything about oil pressure and so on, but at least you do a good visual inspection. So if you checked all the fluids uh, and they are all okay, then that's at least already a good step. But once you do that inspection on the car, uh, make sure that the engine is cold, that the owner did not start it up before you arrived. If you do have a diagnostics tool for your BMW, and I really recommend you get one, because it's handy, you can remove this connector here, and this is your diagnostics connector, uh, which you can plug in an extension cable and then read it out on an OBD2 meter. Now, if you don't have one, try to borrow one from one, and it's always good to read out the OBD2 codes on this car. There's also a connector underneath the dashboard for a standard OBD2 readout. If you're going to spend 15 to 19,000 euros on a car, you might as well invest uh, 35 euros on a small OBD2 meter or even a more expensive one. But they come very cheap and with this one, uh, you can diagnose the faults that are on this engine. In fact, every fault that occurs on the engine will be logged in the ECU. And then you will have a display uh, with the mill light on but sometimes people disable the mill light when they're selling the car and just to hide the problem. With this, you will discover it if there are any issues with any of the systems of the car. Now, there's a lot of BMW specifics that you cannot check with this simple tool. For that, you will need a BMW tool, which runs you about 150 euros. But as a first check to see how good that engine is and what the state of that engine is, this is a very good tool to use. So let me hook it up and then I'm going to show you on how you can read it. It's worthwhile the investment, guys. And after this, we're going to talk about the pitfalls uh, of this engine, things to pay attention to. So underneath the dashboard, you will find the OBD2 plug. And that's where you need to plug in your diagnostics tool. By the way, guys, uh, remember that I said look at the paddles of the car for the wear and tear. Here you can see that these paddles are having their normal wear and tear for the 120,000 clicks that was driven with this car. So here's our little tool. So I'm going to try to plug it in and try not to be in the way. Uh, and this is keyed, guys, so uh, you have to get it in the right direction. There we go, that's connected. So I extended the scanner uh, from underneath the dashboard to the engine bay with an extension cord so you can actually see what it does. So it tells me now to turn on the ignition key, which I will do. But don't start the engine. And now you need to press any key, basically. It's going to scan for the um, protocol that's used on the OBD2. So that's the language to communicate with the ECU. It did found it, and important to see there's no failure light on. Everything is off. There's no codes found, uh, so everything is good. Uh, we can read the codes, for instance, and stored codes. There are no stored codes, so I'm quite happy. And then let's see if there's any pending codes. And there's no pending codes. So this looks really good. I guess it's now time to start talking about the weak spots of this engine. Although it's not that severe, but there still are some points uh, that you should pay attention to. The engines built in 97 to 98 were coated with a special coat on the cylinders and the pistons and called Nicasil. And that coating tended to get loose, it started to chip because of the high sulfur fuels. So if you're buying a car, uh, try to avoid the 97 and 98 engines. Um, most of them were recalled. I'm not sure if all of them were recalled. But that is an engine that I would not go for. That's why I went for a 99, which doesn't have that issue. But besides that, now let's focus on the 1999 engine, and in fact, all of them. Uh, one of the weak spots is that the water pump is a bit undersized, so you may have some cooling problems. So drive the car long enough, let it warm up, and check the temperature. Uh, especially if it's a slightly modified engine, and certainly for the M series, uh, that has always been a little bit of an issue. And normally you would find an additional fan in the front of the radiator for ad additional cooling. The second problem is an oil leak uh, caused by a faulty oil seal between the valve cover and the cylinder head. It's not a big thing, 
but it can spoil many things. And you can see that once you start removing the cover here, that's the one you need to remove, and then pull out the spark plug and then see uh, if the spark plug is oily all around the ceramics or not, or even black burnt. That would be an indication that you actually have a um, bad seal on the valve cover. You could also look inside on the side of the engine block, but there is not a lot of space to see if there is any oil or oil fumes coming out when the engine is hot. Uh, or you crawl underneath the car and you look from underneath. And we'll lift the car up in, a, in, in probably about five minutes or so and then look underneath. And then the last uh, thing which these engines, engines really suffer from is the Vanos system. Now Vanos uh, or Vanos is a system whereby the camshaft is advanced or retarded depending on the power that's required. And this is happening with a piston which is sitting in the system in the front and it's driven by oil and the seal tends to corrode over time or break or whatever and then the advance and the retard of the uh, camshaft isn't working properly anymore. So you're going to have loss of power. The engine will run a little bit rough on idle. And also, um, you can hear a rattle. Now, this can be easily be replaced. This is the part here in the front, and I'll show you a close-up later. Um, but it's around 600 euros uh, to get it replaced if you do it yourself. So you can also overhaul it if you want. But these are things to look for. So if you hear a rattle on the engine, if you feel a loss of power and it doesn't run nicely on idle, most likely you have a Vanos problem. And these are about the only problems that I know of uh, that are weak spots on this engine. Except one more thing, uh, it's on the exhaust collector. The um, catalytic converters, which I have on this one, are actually bolted onto the exhaust. And I have noticed that this car is blowing a little bit when it's cold so most likely that's a seal or something on the exhaust manifold i might have to change the catalytic converters and then you're up for another 800 dollars or euros uh, to replace those if you do it yourself and quite a bit of work to be very honest to do it now if you want to check the leakage of the cylinder seal the easiest way is actually to pram off these little caps and take the valve cover off and then take the spark plugs out and see if they are greasy or oily or not. It's not very hard, uh, it's just a little bit of fiddling you need to do. Now I know if you're buying a car, the owner may not want you to do this kind of work, uh, but then again, uh, you spend a lot of money on this. If you're not allowed to do this, then you can just look underneath the car on the sides and have the engine running up warm and see if you smell or see smoke coming out. Uh, that would be the indication that you have that problem with um, an oil leak on the um, valve cover. I also need to remove the cap and then that should come off. There we go. And here you have the ignition coils, uh, six of them, uh, right on top of the spark plugs. And uh, if you look on the dates on these, they all have the same date, so they were never replaced. Uh, so that's another indication. Now to get to the spark plugs and check if you have an oil leak or not, uh, you will have to undo two bolts on those and uh, unclip this and remove the connector and then pull off the coil and then take out the spark plug. So I'm going to do number two. And then I'm going to disconnect. There we go. Unlock the connector. There we go. Disconnect it. And now I should be able to take out this whole coil. If you're taking out coils like this, I like to keep things together. Not that it's that critical, but it's something I always do. And now just wiggle it out. And here is that ignition coil. It looks very clean. I see no oil on it. So in essence, I don't think there's any need to check on anything else. Uh, it looks very nice. But we can still check on the spark plug or look inside the hole if you don't want to remove the spark plug. Use a flashlight to look inside and you can see the spark plug sitting all the way at the end and it should, there should be no oil or anything around it. Let me show you that with my GoPro and then you can see it. Um, oops. There we go, it's now recording. I hope it is, yeah. See that? See that spark plug right there? 
how clean that is, and this is how it should be. The vano system is fitted in the front of the engine block, and this is where it is. I have an oil feed coming in on the bottom and an oil feed on the other side, and that's going to move that piston in and out depending on the need. And it's going to advance or retard with a couple of tooth wheels the uh, camshafts. And over time, as I said, this um, piston that will wear out and then you're going to have some issues. You will hear a rattling sound or the engine will run pretty rough on idle. And you can't take the Vanus system apart when you're looking at a car. However, you can do a few tests. Make sure that the engine is cold and then start it up and then listen if the engine is running rough or not. Um, spin it up to about 1500, 2000 RPMs and you should not hear any rattle. And obviously, uh, you should take it for a test spin and drive it and see how that runs and then wait till the engine is warm and then check it again and listen for that rattle. All right, so uh, let's start up this engine and see how it runs. Now, I know it is blowing a little bit on the exhaust on this side here only when the engine is cold. So that's why it's so important to start an engine when it's cold and then test drive it and then check it again when it's hot. So the engine is now a bit warmed up and you can see how smooth it runs on idle. The water is basically not moving it and it sounds very smooth. I'm going to give it a little bit of throttle and then we can listen to the rattle if there is any. This engine runs very smooth and it doesn't have any rattle. So we are quite all right with the Vanos system. So the next thing is to take the car for a test ride and see how the brakes are working, if it's pulling up straight and things like that and see how it shifts gear. First thing we're gonna do is see if all the lights come on. And they do. And then we start the car and they should turn off. All right, so let's go and see. The gearbox is a five-speed gearbox and it can be a little bit hard to put it in reverse, but this works quite well. I found on this car that selecting it to gear number three is not that easy sometimes. Uh, I often ended up in fifth gear. And this BMW is having the clunking problem. You will hear it in the back. I'm not sure exactly what it is, if it's the differential or whatever it is, but something is clunking each time you change gears. And this is something to be checked for because many of them have this problem. I don't know if you can hear it. I don't know if you can hear the clunking sound, but... So something really feels loose in the back. So the first test you want to do is to accelerate with the car and see if it accelerates in a straight line. If it doesn't pull left or right. And you can do this uh, with very simply letting the steering wheel go. And now let the steering wheel go and then accelerate, right? And it pulls in a straight line, so that's good. The next step is to brake and let the steering wheel go, but keep your hands close and see if the car brakes in a straight line and I expect that this car will actually do that. And it does. Now we're going to drive around and see if this, the gearbox works fine and that seems to work real well and smooth so not an issue with that. However, I have the clunking sound and that's not good so we we'll check that one soon as we are back in the shop. So we just got back from our test ride and the car drove very well. No abnormal sounds on the engine. The clutch was working properly. It grips where it's supposed to grip, like on two thirds. It shifts very nicely, the gearbox, um, but I always had a bit of an issue between my second and third gear. Often I ended up in fifth gear. It's a little bit of aiming. I'm not sure if that's quite normal. I, I need to check that out, but no funny sounds and it worked fine. I do have the clunking sound in the back on the rear axle. Don't know exactly what it is. It can have many reasons for that, but the Z3 is well known for that problem. And in fact, one of the issues is even a ripped off mounting bracket for the differential. That would be very bad if that was the case. And you should check it into the trunk side as well. And we'll do that in a few minutes uh, to see uh, what that issue is. But check that area, area anyway if you have 
Z3 that you want to buy. We also did a brake test where we braked on a straight line. So you let the steering wheel go, keep your hands closed, of course, and you brake and you see if the car shifts left or right. They shouldn't. They should go in a straight line forward while you're braking. The same thing you do on a bit of gravel. Uh, try to brake and see if your ABS is working. So the wheel should not be blocking. And then finally, we did accelerate with the car and the car was accelerating in a straight line uh, with the steering wheel let loose, of course, keeping your hands close by. So all this is very good. And once we got back, uh, you rechecked the temperature of the engine and that was normal. So these are the things you should do on your test ride. And of course, the overall feel of the car, the rattling and whatever, how are the seats, everything is working, can you move them back and forth, can you adjust them, are they not worn out, all these kind of things. And there's one last thing you really want to do is to check the exhaust fumes. Once you're back from your test ride, park the car, have someone to push the throttle and look at the fumes in the back. The fumes should not be blue, should not be white. After you've done the test ride, the pipes should be dry and kind of real dark, dark gray. That's a, a pretty good color to have. If it's pitch black and, and a bit greasy, then it's no good. So let me start up the car and then see what the fumes are doing. So, so far we have not looked on the platform itself, which is the E36 platform, which is the chassis, let's say, underneath. We're going to be looking at the weak spots, uh, if there are any, and we will be looking on the suspension and we'll be looking at the drive mechanism. So the drive shafts on the front to the back and then the short drive shafts and the CV joints going to the rear wheels and the differential, because all of these cars have a weak spot, namely the differential mounting underneath the chassis. So let us lift this up and then have a look. I do recommend that if you intend to buy a car like this that you take it to someone that has a lift or somewhere else where you can crawl underneath. You may even want to jack it up if you want to but do that because that will tell you a lot about the car. So let's get it up. With the car checked up, it's always good to check the tires. And if you see a car with brand new tires on, then you should be a little bit suspicious because nobody's putting new tires on just before he's selling it, or not normally. Um, it's better to have the older tires or tires that have been on the car for a while. So you can actually see the wear and tear on these tires. So that will tell you how good the geometry of the car is. Now this car has some very nice rims on it and I even think the discs have been dealt with in the back so somebody cleaned that up, that's good. So here you have the front discs and they are kind of looking alright, they are not grooved, they are not really worn, they've been used a little bit but not excessively so they must have been replaced at some moment in time. So that is good, so let us have a look on the brake caliber itself, well the brake caliber looks quite alright. Um, it's clean, as you can see, nothing really wrong with it. And of course it has some brake dust on it, but that's quite normal. And the brake pads are all right too. Uh, the thickness is okay. Uh, I just double checked that, but we'll see that from the inside better. Now, this is a low cost replacement anyway, so I wouldn't worry too much about it, but it's always good to double check on that. So we're looking from underneath the car. Uh, we're looking at the front side of the car where the engine is. and. Check out that the engine is really dry. There should be no oil leaks whatsoever. So that looks good. Um, I also noticed that we have a new uh, suspension arm here, uh, which we don't have on the other side. And this happens to be the side where also we have the new light. So maybe that was all part of that accident that happened some time ago. Uh, but this looks good because I don't see no deformation. So I don't mind to see a new part because it means the car has been maintained. But pay attention to that. The other side doesn't have that. Uh, it's still the original one. So I think I would normally replace both sides. Uh, 
If one is gone, that would also do the other side, but okay, it is what it is. Now you can see rust is really not an issue on all these uh, members and chassis because that's pretty good. Um, so uh, overall, this looks quite all right. The exhaust is right here, and this is where the catalytic converters are. And those are the ones that are making a little bit of noise when the engine is cold. It blows a little bit, so I might have to fix that issue. But overall, you will see that this chassis is in a very good state. You can look on the cells and the rails underneath the chassis, and this is all pretty well and in a real good condition. So it hasn't been scraping on anything, uh, which is something I always worry about. If you see dents in this and abnormal bends or so, then that means the car has had a serious accident in the past. But that doesn't seem to be the case. So check that out, that all these outriggers and the sills are straight and have no deformation or funny kind of cracks in them. Here we have the five-speed gearbox and the oil in it never needs to be replaced according to BMW. Now I'm not a believer in that. I will change the oil eventually on this one once I do the big maintenance on this car. But if you're checking yours, make sure that nothing is wet. You have no oil leaks coming out of it. The other thing you might want to check is this hose here. This is actually your hose for your clutch and sometimes they can become soft and be the cause of the clunks that you might hear. So now uh, let's have a look on the main drive shaft. So you have the drive shaft going to the back of the car connected to the gearbox through a flex ring. And this flex disc or flex ring here um, can go bad so you need to check that. Uh, if it's not cracked or so, because if it goes bad, you will have a clunking sound. So this one looks like it's not too bad, but I think I will change it anyway, because these things are really suffering. And it's not an expensive part to replace. It's about 50 euros uh, to get it changed, Then the job isn't all that hard to do. So the drive shaft then connects to the rear differential. So now let's have a look on the back. Now, I don't think this is the problem here of the clunking sound on this car. And here we have the differential and um, that one can go bad. That is actually mounted with a rubber on the side here and that rubber can wear out and can cause clunking. So you might want to check that rubber right here, how much play there is on. And I will try to give you a close up in a few minutes. You may also have problems with backlash on the differential that can cause the clunking. And you may have issues on the drive shafts or the prop shafts going to the wheels. The CV joints may be worn out or the gates may be ripped apart. So be aware of that because that's a little bit of work to replace that. So if you hold one side and you block that wheel or you have someone to block in the other side, uh, then you can turn the other side of the wheel and see how much backlash you have. And I see that we have a little bit of it on this side, but that's the kind of checks you should do. Now the oil in the differential is also what they call a once in a lifetime oil, so you never need to change it. And here we have the bushing for the differential mount, often the cause of the clunking. So the bushing can be a problem, but also the bracket can be a problem because that's pot welded on the, on the translateral beam there. And these pot melts can break off or even this whole bracket here can come loose so you need to check on that and that's the bracket that I was referring to you see these spot welds they should be in a good condition and this bracket looks quite all right to be honest so there's nothing wrong with this bracket locally on an M series you often see a lot of issues with that another area to inspect is where your rear axle connects to the chassis and this area tends to be uh, error prone for rust and you can see a little bit of surface rust we can also see the bolts a bit being rusted and somebody sprayed some I don't know rust prevention on it um, and then the bushes here they can go bad as well so that might be another issue that we might have to fix on this specific car uh, but check that out because all that is a lot of work and you should negotiate with the seller to reduce the price if you see rust in this area if you see play on these bushes the suspension arms for the rear wheels are another area of concern often and you need to look on the bushes that are sitting right there. They tend to wear out very quickly and I think we have a problem on this car. And here you have a little bit of a better close-up on these bushes. These are those and you might have to replace them 
at certain times. And you can see there's a bit of surface rust here uh, so on the rear axle. So that uh, is something I want to clean up on this car. But okay, uh, it's not critical if you see that. Those can all be cleaned up. So I think we looked at most of the important parts underneath the car and as you have seen, the weak spot is really all about the differential and the differential area. The bushes that are supporting the rear axle and the trailing arms to the rear wheels. So these are the things you really need to pay attention to because that's where the clunking noise most of the time is coming from. And it's not that the parts are so expensive uh, to get. It's just the labor that it takes. It's a lot of work to renew a rear axle of a Z3. Just to get it from underneath, there's a lot of bolts to undo, and then you have to get all the bushes out. Some people have to burn them out. It's really a lot of work. So if you have the chance to look at a Z3 and uh, it doesn't have these issues or just a little bit, then this is a good buy. Is it have, if it has those issues, then I would say, look, really bargain on the price. Deduct at least 1,000 to 2,000 euros from that. So folks, we've come to the end uh, of this video and I hope I was able to show you where all the weak spots are of the Z3. Now, the Z3 is a very low maintenance car. It's in fact a very good car and the six cylinder is so nice. Uh, it's very reliable as well. But there are a few weak spots. The oil seal on the valve cover, the Vanus, and that's for sure you will have to replace that after about 120, 150,000 kilometers. It's around 600 euros and a little bit of a cooling efficiency uh, on the M-Series. But this is not an M-Series, so we don't have that problem. For the rest, that engine is rock solid and it's a champ to drive with. It's really, really nice. In terms of corrosion and rust, there is not a lot to be talked about on this car. This car is a very good anti-corrosion. It has some issues here and there, and if you find some corrosion, then it's mainly going to be in the back where the rear axle is mounted to the chassis. I've shown you that. Uh, but these are areas we can have easy access to. You may also have some more issues with the differential in the back. There may be too much backlash, and I've seen that before, especially if the car has been driven very enthusiastic. The prop shafts may have an issue and may have to be replaced, but also the bushings of the trailing arms that go into the rear wheels may need to be replaced, and I have the case on this one. And also the bushes that are holding the rear axle may need to be replaced. And then you have the diff itself. Well, the diff is mounted with this uh, big bushing. That bushing typically goes bad as well, so you might want to replace that one. And overall, um, there are not many issues with that, except that maybe the mounting bracket for the diff can be uh, damaged or ripped off the chassis partially. For that, you would need to check that outrigger underneath. Uh, but that's typically for the M-Series. The normal Z-Series doesn't have that problem. And for the rest, uh, there is not much more to be said about this car. I hope you find yours, because they are really fun and worthwhile getting. Thank you for viewing, and bye-bye.